Not in the face! <laughs> Thank you. Hello and welcome to Hey, Not the Face with your host, John Nash, and your producer, me, Steffi Haynes. And today we are going to give you a primer for the UFC antitrust case because it is about to get rolling and we want to make sure that you have all of your I's dotted and your T's crossed and you could take a pop quiz at any given time on the antitrust suit. That is how well we are going to inform you. But first, I'm going to turn it over to John because he has a mini announcement about our Substack. So John, take it away. Oh, I do have a mini announcement. But first, I just want to point out that we might not be as thorough as you say about the antitrust case. No one, <laughs> there's, there'll be no tests at the end, so we don't want there to make false There is going promises. to be a test. Don't listen to John. There will be no tests John. at the end of this. There will I be. Wanna, I'm sorry. To, <laughs> keep going. Keep going. There will be no tests. That's all I'm saying. There's going to be a out test. For the people. There, no, this is we are very we're, we are very <laughs> very very nonchalant and no tests. It's it, we it'll be easier to pass here than uh, community college. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we have an announcement, and the announcement is this. If you're listening, you might know, but you might be listening somewhere else, or you can tell friends. We have a new Substack. me and Stephanie here have put out, um, uh, conveniently named the Hey Not The Face Substack, uh, found at heynottheface.substack.com on Substack, uh, and, and we will be covering all things business and MMA and boxing. Uh, obviously covering the antitrust lawsuit, covering fighter and boxer pay, contracts, including any changes in analysis that we come upon contracts, the finances, all that stuff. Uh, and I might get back to a little MMA or boxing history stuff. The old, people remember that's where I kind of started, but uh, I haven't done that in a while. So we're going to cover all that and on interviews. the Substack. And interviews. Most, what, what's that? And interviews. We're Oh, going yes, to be I, throwing in an interview here and there, too. Yeah, and I had a note for that. And I didn't even mention it, but we, we plan <laughs> on getting some interviews in as well, adding interviews. We're hoping to add a bunch more interviews. So um, a lot of this is going to be free, you know, so we are going to offer a lot of content free. And usually probably some of the most uh, – Essential stuff will be free because I think it should be widely distributed. Distributed, But also when we get in the nuts and bolts, we're going to have a lot of very in-depth stuff. That is going to be behind a paywall. Now, I know some people, you know, the times are tough for some people. They can't afford. We're going to we have multi-tiers for payment, $5 a month, $50 a year. Some of you that, you know, that might be asking too much of all your other subscriptions and stuff. That's fine with the free content. But we are hoping if you want us to continue to examine this case and other things like it. If you want us to continue looking at contracts, look at fighter pay, look at the finances of UFC one and other promotions, we're hoping you feel it and feel it deep in your heart, deep in your soul to subscribe. And then you'll get access to all that other stuff. Indeed. And just so you know, we had discussed in our previous episode, episode number 41 or 42, I can't remember because we recorded track. back to back. But on one of those episodes, we did mention that we were going to rename the Hey Not The Face Substack to the Combat Sports Journal. We are not going to do that. We're going to hold on to that name for something in the future. Maybe we'll add a, a new tab on the Substack or something along those lines. But for now and the foreseeable future, it's going to be Hey Not The Face because that's how you know us. For the past year and a half, we have been podcasting under that name and turning in work under that name. So we're going to stay with Hey Not The Face. I like it. I think it it's perfect as is. I it's never my, wanted to change it. This guy wanted to change it. Well, listen, I just thought it's my battle cry. Just I don't know if it's fitting for a website. Oh. But I think every, I've been using it as my Twitter account. Not The Face was my old handle on a lot of websites. So I figure people probably if they, they 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 probably recognize that name if they know my work. Exactly. I recognize it from the forums because you used to be in the underground and the sure dog forums. So I recognize it from there. Anywho, it is time for us to jump into this stuff. So my first question, it's not really a question uh, as it pertains to the content. It's basically I want to know um 
if you saw Nate Diaz's tweet about Conor McGregor. Yes, I did see that tweet. Well, what did you think of it? Let's start well, with that. Okay. Well, the for people aren't, I guess, weren't didn't see the tweet or see it. Nate Diaz, there was a um, uh, a screen grab, I think, from uh, the Mac Life with a quote from Conor McGregor talking about how the date that he keeps wanting to fight keeps getting pushed back, and he keeps waiting to get a date, and he's not he's not getting it. And and Nate Diaz said, you know, this was me for years before Conor even got here. They want you to die before you get out of these contracts. It's up to you to make something pop. No one's going to help you but you. So it seems like Nate, and this is something we talked about previously, the idea that the UFC might be freezing Conor McGregor's contract, keeps extending it because they don't want to let him go. And I think this is what Nate Diaz is commenting on because if people remember, it took him forever to get out of his contract. He had signed it in 2016. It took him over six years to finish his UFC, his six-fight UFC contract. And one of the reasons was they kept offering him Chimaev, uh, who was one of the top guys in his division, where Nate Diaz at the time was no longer ranked. Obviously, they were hoping Chimaev would beat the crap out of him on the way out. Nate turned the fight down. Uh, I've got from multiple sources, I think it's been, I think Ariel Hawani confirmed this too, that Nate Diaz, uh, when he, he was offered other fights against other fighters, like let's say Dustin Poirier, but there was an a, a attached contract with that. So he could only take those fights if he signed an agreement to extend his contract multiple fights. So he turned that down. So they kept extending his contract. Eventually, h- him and his attorney said, you have to put an end date. This is the final date. Uh, I think at that point, it was implied that they might go to court. The UFC agreed uh, and gave him one more offer, <laughs> Chemayev, who Nate Diaz accepted. And he lucked out because Chemayev missed weight and uh, Tony Ferguson replaced him. So that's the story of Nate Diaz. And this does seem somewhat familiar what we're seeing with Conor McGregor, where Conor McGregor keeps asking for a fight. We don't know what's going behind the scenes, but he says he's ready to fight. He's ready to fight. And, Dan, and Dana White keeps saying he doesn't want to fight because he's got money or he's recovering from his injury. They give a bunch of other excuses. So I think that's what's going on. All right. Have you seen the news that Jose Aldo is coming back since we're talking about Connor and Jose Aldo was sort of the beginning of his champion. Well, he was the beginning of his UFC champion um, trajectory. So let's talk about him because he is coming back to headline UFC 301 or co-head uh co-main event it's sort of up in the air right now i think he's listed he's gonna be the co-main but yeah i saw that he's coming back it's kind of interesting because he said he was leaving mma ufc behind to go box he did do some you know boxing events on fight pass but now he's back and uh i find it interesting and my sources and they're pretty good sources say the reason he's back is because he wanted to box on uh, Jake Paul's event with uh, Tyson, uh, Mike Tyson, uh, the UFC would not grant permission because he's technically still under UFC contract. And they said, you know, he had to finish his contract first. And so he's coming back. He said he'd take a fight to finish out his contract because then he can go into any boxing event he wants to. Or MMA, I guess, at that point, if he finishes his contract. Wow. Damn. So they needed him, though. Let's Let's not make any bones about that they needed him because that ufc 301 card is absolutely terrible yeah well i mean that's the the that's part of the benefit of the ufc is they got contracted revenue so they can put these stacked events on 299 was a great card on paper and ended up you know uh some zip ended being fairly entertaining uh 300 is of course the ufc 300 to do gangbusters um because of that though as long as they met, meet whatever requirements they have for the event, I think one of the requirements is they have to have a championship out. It seems to be one of the um, the quality control measures. They can put anything on, almost anything they want, and they still get. And we now know the amount right now. We have we knew vaguely what it was before, but according to the UFC, uh, during an earnings call, they said to, to their investors, they said that it was $20 million every time they have a pay-per-view. That's how much they get from the uh, domestic broadcaster for the pay-per-view and that would be spn so they get 20 million dollars every time they put on a pay-per-view and what's also interesting that 20 million dollars goes to all the ebitda uh, in other words there's no expenses on that because the expenses are covered by the other revenue streams so it's pure profit when they hold a, a, pay- a pay-per-view good lord 
So I guess it's time to go ahead and crack open this antitrust case now that we've got a little bit of our uh, fodder to chew on, our appetizer, so to speak. So now let's go ahead and look at this antitrust case. Now it's scheduled to go to trial on April 15th, which is, you know, the Monday right after UFC 300. So I guess we need to get everybody up to speed on the details. My first question is, when was this case originally filed? Uh, Because it's been going for a long time. And who filed it? Well, the very first complaint was filed back in 2014. On December 16, 2014, I know because I was there in San Jose courtroom when it was filed. Um, in fact, I'm going to boast a little bit. Me and Brent Brookhouse were the people that broke the story a few days earlier that there was an uh, antitrust suit was coming, class action. So I was there when it was filed. And the first three named plaintiffs on that, that complaint were Kung Lee, which is why it's the Lee et al. v. Zufa case. Uh, John Fitch and Nate Corey were the first three. Now, several other complaints were fall, filed over the, n- the next few months. Uh, They were all merged into one complaint, and some of the litigants dropped out, but the rest were merged in this case. So now the name litigants, besides those first original ones, Brandon Vera, Javier Vasquez, and Cal Kingsbury were added. And those are the name plaintiffs. What happened to Nate Quarry? Because I feel like before we go on, we should say what happened to Nate Quarry because he is no longer on this case, right? He's no longer a plaintiff. No, he's no longer because he was a, a, a named plaintiff on what was called the identity class. There's a bout class and identity class. And he was on the identity class and the bout class was granted class certification, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, and the identity class was not. And so Nate Quarry, he no longer, since he was not part of the bout class, is no longer part of this. What do the plaintiffs allege that the defendants did? And the defendants, just for the people just now tuning in, the defendants are the UFC. Yep. And the plaintiffs are the fighters. So yeah, and what... I should point out, too, is often the defendant is called Zufa. Mm. Zufa was the original, the parent company of the UFC. Is the That's the company that they, they do business as the UFC, but really the U- Zufa is the UFC. It was That's the company that the Fertitas and Dana White formed back in 2001 to buy the UFC from SCG. So what are they saying that Zufa UFC at all did? Well, the, the allegations, I mean, it's gone through some metamorphosis since its original complaint because there was a scheme and stuff dropped, but basically it boils down to three components, right? One is they say they use exclusive contracts that are not that help them be non-competitive in other words they use these exclusive contracts to do to, to uh, uh uh basically t- uh lock in fighters into the promotion and make them unavailable to other promoters that's step one step two is they use their market power uh to use extra contractual methods to basically make those contracts permanent and such methods is like with hey, we, nate diaz we talked about they claim is that you know they can they since they control everything they can offer fighters fights that they don't want or even can't take, let's say, on a certain date, out of the country, whatever, and and then use the, contr- the contract, the means in the contract to keep extending that contract so basically they're perpetual, that a fighter can't get out of that. And they use these extra contractual methods to do that. And, you know, and again, when you have the power to set up matchups uh, like Joe Silva had where he can pick the fighter, it gives you a lot of great a uh, lot of power, extra ability to do stuff, right? Or or champion offer you a title fight and you say you don't get the title fight unless you sign this contract. That's kind of a course of method to keep the contract going, right? So that's step two. And step three is they acquired and shuttered uh, competing promotions, the major competing promotions that had other top fighters, headliners, as they call it. And those are the three things they did to take over the market and basically have what they call a monopsony, and a monopsony uh, is the opposite of a monopoly. So a monopoly, if, if most people know, a monopoly is when you're the only seller of a good. A monopoly is you're the only buyer. And here, this sense, we don't mean that there's only one buyer at all. It means they have the, there's such a major, the buyer and have such a control over the market that they dictate what the price is when they buy the, when they make their purchases and what they're buying is elite level MMA talent. So th- because they are such a major player, 
they control how much elite level MMA talent has to pay. And that's the allegations that the UFC use those three methods to gain monopsony power over the industry and are abusing it and underpaying the fighters because of that. Let's go back for a second. Tell everyone what a class action means as far as a lawsuit. Okay, well, the suit was filed and they were, ask, they were asking to make it a class action. What a class action means is instead of just having one person file a lawsuit on their own behalf, a class action means you're doing it on behalf of numerous litigants. And the, the reason you do that on behalf of numerous plaintiffs is that uh, because one is it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not – it's not easy uh, for everybody to do the the lawsuit that they don't have access. They, they just find it difficult on their own, not worthwhile to follow their own lawsuit. That's one reason. The other is it's just there's too many complaints to have everybody file their own suit. And, the, and the, the, there's such similarities between those complaints, allegations that all these, these uh, potential plaintiffs have, that it's better just to fold them up into a class action. And so in this case, they asked the named plaintiffs asked to represent – not just themselves, but all the fighters in the UFC that fought during the class period and met the requirements to be a class member. And that is uh, from December 16, 2010 until June 30th, 2017. And that, so, mean, but, that, that class was the one that was certified, right? Yeah, that is the bout class, it's called. Okay. So bout meaning you fought, they had about a match. They fought in the UFC during that time. And that's about 1,200 fighters. So... Uh, probably a little over, but the, the so the name plaintiffs now re they represented those twelve hundred, and now that it's been certified as a class action, basically even though the name plaintiffs are still the the name plaintiff, the guys representing the class, the lawsuit is no longer just those six suing the UFC. It's technically all twelve hundred fighters. Now there was a period of time where any fighter that wanted to get out of the class action that they could. But none of them did, correct? Not a single one. Well, w one fighter tried to get out of the class action. He sent a letter to the court saying he doesn't want to take part, which was interesting was he was not a member of the class. He <laughs> didn't fit the requirements. So so that's, I guess. Can I ask who that was? Uh, Rory Markham, I think it was. Okay. I think so. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it was him. It was the, he was the one guy, his, his last fight in the UFC was like in 2010 or right before the start of the class period. So before December 16, 2010 was his last fight in the UFC. So he was not eligible as a class member, but it's good to know he didn't want to be a member of it. <laughs> All right. So the complaint was originally filed, as you said, in December, 2014, it's, it's now 2024. What in the heck made it take almost a decade? Yeah, it's been a while. Oh, boy. So numerous things. One is these are not simple cases. It takes years no matter what because – you have to go through all the different filings. There's a process of, you you know, first you you file and you ask the court. They moved it from San Jose to Vegas. That's why the court is taking the case taking place in Vegas now. They go through a process of discovery where they have to hand over. I, I think it was a million documents the plaintiffs got from the UFC, Zufa. And so that took year, two years right there just to go through all the documents and then hire experts to go look through the documents and come up with models and, and regressions and expert reports to explain from the plaintiff's point of view how uh, the UFC monop took over the industry and gained monopsony power. Then the defendants get a chance to write their own reports. So that's a several-year process. Then on top of it, we run into a few problems. One is COVID hit. So that adds some time because it's hard to go to the court. They were shut down for a while. And the other major one is there was a um, another court that was cited by the UFC uh, only on a tuna case. We call it the tuna case, and that had uh, that had a standard that was the judge had come up with a new standard of how you how you grant class certification. The UFC said the the the, the fighters they don't meet that standard, and so that had to work through the system, go through appeal and everything. And when it was finally shot down by the Ninth Circuit, uh, the judge then granted class certification because no longer was that case standing in the way. So that's a big part of why it took so long. Now, we talked about the bout class that ended up getting certified, but there's another class called the identity class. First thing I want you to do is 
say what the identity class means and why was it not certified? Well, the identity class, what it is, the difference that it is between the bout is the identity represents the identity using the intellectual property, right? So uh, it's every UFC fighter whose identity was expropriated or exploited by the UFC. And this includes all their license merchandise agreement or UFC promotional materials and and I, I, the video game. All the image right stuff belong to the identity class, right? And it covered the same period. There was the same class. But the judge didn't grant that. One of his, first of all, that class is smaller because the UFC, a lot of, a lot of fighters enter the UFC, but the UFC doesn't use their, put them on merchandise, right? Doesn't put them in the video games. So it's a smaller class. There's less damages involved. But the main reason it wasn't granted is because there was no way they, there was no consistent uh, way to, in other, the UFC didn't use what seemed to be a consistent method to, to, to declare how they're going to pay all the members of the identity class. Where with the the bout class, they can look at it. They have diagrams that show that the UFC pays guy a, a certain contract when they first enter. The tiers go up. It, it was easy to show where they, you know, in other words, what they were getting paid by the UFC and, and also make models that could show what they're supposed to get paid. With the identity class, because so much of it was kind of discretionary, payment by the UFC for being a member of the identity class, the plaintiffs could not show, or at least show the, the court didn't agree, didn't approve of it. They didn't have a method that showed exactly how the UFC was underpaying them because there was no model they could put together, if that makes sense. Was that the most major hurdle? Were there any others? Well, there was, I mean, no, that was basically the, 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 the biggest hurdle for the identity class, but that got struck down. That's where Nate Corey is a member of that. And because it wasn't granted, he is no longer part of the complaint. But the damages in that is, I'm thinking about the $50 million mm. uh, air range, where if you look at the bout class, we're talking hundreds and possibly billions of dollars in damages. So there's a, just a huge difference in what's being asked for both classes. While we're here, let's talk about injunctive relief. Explain what it is and explain how very important it is. Well, in addition to asking for damages for the, the fighters because the fighters were underpaid or their pay was uh, suppressed by the UFC, they the the plaintiffs have been asking for what's called injunctive relief. And what they're that is is they're asking for the court to go in and order the UFC to change its behavior to fix the the conditions they've created. In other words, they've monopolized the industry. We need the court to step in and, and make the UFC change its behavior so we can undo the market power they've gained, uh, according to the plaintiffs, illegally. So injunctive relief could be could take many different forms. It's got to be a, a negative. It can't be a positive. In other words, you, get, you basically have to tell them to stop doing something. You can't tell them to start doing something. So well, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, the court's going to order them to, you know, the all the act into MMA. The judge has no power to do that. He couldn't do that. He couldn't order them to impose the Ali Act into the, into the UFC. But what he can do and what the plaintiffs are asking for him is to order uh, one suggestion they've given is he could limit the length of contracts to a year or two in length. That's what they're, they've been asking him. Another one, an example from the International Boxing Club of New York is that all contracts for a period of time can be not, can't be exclusive with the UFC. So uh, fighters that were signed to agreements to the UFC, uh, all future agreements had to be uh, solely uh, non-exclusive. So you'd sign with the UFC, but you're free to shop around and fight for anybody. That's what happened to the International Boxing Club of New York. So those would be examples of injunctive relief. It is fair to say that injunctive relief would probably be the most important part of this case, correct? It, it would have. It would have been the most important, uh, but uh, I'm sure we'll get to, we'll get more into this. But injunctive relief is no longer part of the Lee v. Johnson case. But yes, uh, I believe personally, and I think uh, the 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 chief uh, attorney of the UFC, the lead attorney, Bill Isaacson, he had an interview once uh, or put a quote about how. Uh, without the, the the business model, of the UFC is not threatened because injunctive relief is not part of the case. And I think that's the 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 injunctive relief damages, the monetary damages they're asking for are huge, and that would be something. But injunctive relief would completely change the business model of the UFC, especially the injunctive relief that we're talking about, the most extreme version of very short contracts or non-exclusive. All right, let's talk about 
why injunctive relief is not on the table for a, this case, but it is for the uh, Johnson case. Yes. So uh, I guess since you mentioned it, I should point out to people that are listening. There's two cases, actually. The one we're talking about right now that's going to trial is the Lee v. Zufa case. The Kung Lee one filed December 16, 2000, uh, December, yeah, 16, 2014. And in and 2021, early end of June, early July, I can't remember the exact date, a second case was filed, the Johnson v. Zufa case, with Cajun Johnson and uh, C.B. Dalloway as the two named plaintiffs. And that case is basically identical to the first case. The, the, they allege that the UFC has got a monopsy, but that case starts up on July 1st, 2017, and it continues to this day. Now we're in just the beginning phases of that where, you know, the judge is having them hand in paperwork and stuff where we haven't even got to any of the, you know, we don't really even have an official case in that one yet. So that case is just in the very early stages, but because there was a split in the class in 2017, uh, there is uh, two classes, two cases that cover two different groups of class members. And for various reasons that they're, they're considered two different class members, the Lee case can't have injunctive relief. They offered it to him. Do you want to go for injunctive relief? But if they did, it sounded like what he was going to have, the judge was going to happen is they'd have to open discovery into the Johnson case first, which would take a couple of years. And then they could come have the trial for Lee with injunctive relief on the table. The plaintiff said, we are willing to not have injunctive relief for Lee. And so this is just a trial for monetary damages, but after this, if the Johnson case goes forward, Johnson, the judge made it clear, in Johnson, they will consider the inju any in necessary injunctive relief. And that came uh, with a caveat, though. They had, this case had to be won by the plaintiffs for injunctive relief to be on the table, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, it wasn't like you had to win, but it's going to be really hard mm -hmm. To make your case, very hard to make your case if you don't win this case. Sure, sure. But I just want to point it out. Just, just yes. To no, uh, cross that's what all the our stakes. T's. That's what the stakes are in this case. The stakes are huge because not only does this case represent damages for the league class period, a, a victory in this case for the plaintiffs would mean that in th there's a, the Johnson case could go forward because the D Johnson case would also be hurt at this Lee case fails, but the Lee case wins, the Johnson case can go forward and injunctive relief is on the table. For the defendants, Zufa, a victory in this case means not only do they win against uh, Lee v. Uh, Zufa, but it also basically ends the threat of a, a Johnson case with injunctive relief. Now, about a month ago, sometime between three and four weeks, it hasn't quite been a month, we saw um, an update from the courts and basically everybody jumped the gun and thought that maybe they were having settlement talks, but you told me that this is something that is standard in court cases. And basically it, it's a meeting of the minds behind closed doors to see if anybody's even looking at settling. Correct. <sighs> Y yes, but with the caveat, I said it's a possibility that right. that's it because the court right. ordered it. Yes, but it, sure. yes, it could be. It could be more than that, though. Okay, so what are the chances that the two parties go ahead and settle at this late, you know, juncture in the trial? You know, we're three weeks out from from it. So, yeah. does it look like they're going to settle? I mean, what are the chances of that now? Well. If you if you followed along the journey with us, we've been here for many many years since the very beginning covering this, mm -hmm. and on Show Money with Paul Gift and uh, Jason Cruz, I had said for a long time that I was convinced there would be a settlement. There would be a settlement because the risk was so great to the UFC. Now, after injunctive relief was taken off the table, I changed my mind. I said I don't think the UFC is going to settle because it's too much of their benefit, right? To, uh, to not settle and win this case outright and get injunctive relief completely gone. Don't have to pay damages then. And even if they lost the case and they paid damages, it's not going to cripple a company because they make so much money now. They make so much more money now, more than they did back then because of the ESPN deal. But in the last couple of weeks, I've kind of gone back the other way. I'm not certain there's going to be a settlement, but I do think it's possible that a settlement uh, re-enters the picture because one is – 
is, uh, again, the, I, it was interesting that um, Ari Emanuel mentioned it in an earnings call. And that told me that, okay, you would, the, the stress that there is some talks, it seems to be like you're trying to alleviate your investors uh, that that there can't be bad news from a, a lot of the trial coming up, right? Uh, the other thing is because I had been speaking to some researchers, and we'll talk about this later, some um, investment researchers. One of the things they, you know, the, the concern is because of Mc, Vince McMahon's problems with uh, WWE and the pressure it's actually been putting on TKO stock because there's the scandal of Vince McMahon, there's the potential scandal of other people in the WWE, him selling tons of stock, putting pressure on their uh, stock price, TKO. It might be in the best interest of the UFC now is to not fight this case, but to settle it because you need to not have investors worry that another shoe might drop on this company. Because right now the concern is it's just one more thing hanging over them where before it was, you know, if it was this was the only thing they had to settle, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But there's multiple things. So the stock price is probably w much lower than they think it should be. And it's not going to get better until, you know, until this is taken care of. And if they lose the trial uh, and they have to pay damages, that'll hurt the stock. But even worse is then people start will start asking about injunctive relief, which will start suppressing the stock even more. So I am now come around where I don't think it's a guarantee, but I do think settlement seems much more on the table now a possibility. And th the other possibility is they wait to see what they, what they get for the jury selection because you can try settling during the trial usually. And the, one of the big things is both sides, I'm sure, have done mock juries. And those mock juries, you know, they can tell how the public is going to react to the evidence. And if either side is like, oh, my God, if we get these type of people, we're guaranteed to lose, there's a chance that they wait to see what jury selection is and go, damn it, we got three people that fit this demographic that always vote against us. We, you know, we're quitting. We're, we're, we got to settle this. So th that's a possibility. The other possibility is that the, in mock jury, either side is, you know, things have gone so badly for them, they decide uh, we should look to settle this case. So I have come around a little bit, not guaranteeing it. I'm not as strong as I was before where I think it's a guarantee. But I do think a settlement is uh, is back on the table. It's no longer an impossibility. If they settle, what happens to the Johnson case? And will injunctive relief still be on the table? Well, that would matter depend on what the settlement was. I don't think if the UFC is going to settle, I don't think they're going to settle just the Lee case. You would think okay. they would settle for the Johnson case at the same time because why settle the Lee case? Because the Lee plaintiffs, you can't make a settlement and – and settle and take off injunctive relief without the agreement from the without Johnson and uh, and uh, CB Dalloway and that team agreeing to the settlement because that's their lawsuit now, right? You can't you can't do a uh, make a settlement on behalf of another suit and that party has no say in it. So if they did do it, I would believe they would ask to settle both cases. And if that's the case, and I, I'm not sure if this holds up. But remember John Fitch. Nate Corey, those guys were – Kung Lee too. Those guys were pretty adamant that they wanted some sort of change in the UFC behavior if they settled. So I would guess if there's a settle, it would be monetary, but there would be some sort of contractual changes as well. All right. So before we wrap up the free section and get into our bonus paywalled section, I have one last question. Just to reiterate, how is a verdict in this case going to be determined well, it's it's a jury trial, not a bench trial. So the judge is not determining. The judge would decide injunctive relief if we ever get to that in the Johnson case. But for this trial, it's a jury trial. There will be eight jurors. Um, they have to. There's a selection process. They don't get nearly. They can't strike nearly as many in this case as you could in like a murder trial. So that's one probably one of the fears, I guess, is if you if you have a certain demographic when you do these mock trials that always is against you, right? And you and you have a limited amount of strikes. You're like, it's hard to get rid of those people. A lot of them might show up in the jury pool based on how pop, you know, how often you find them in the, the general populace. Um, and then the jury, but the jury has to be unanimous in its verdict. So you got to get all eight to agree that the UFC engaged in this behavior. Now, the explanation I got is that they don't have to be, they'll be like, they all have to agree on the scheme, basically. The UFC engaged in the scheme. But my understanding is because there's components to the scheme, even though they have to agree that this was done 
uh, by the UFC to do attain monopsony power and, and violate the Sherman Act, they can kind of fudge about and say, well, I really think the UFC did this, this, and this, and maybe not that as much. But those together, that means they engaged in this scheme. So it's you only have to convince them about portions of it at a time. And then when they vote, all eight have to vote uh, affirm that it was done. All right. So, folks, if you are not a paid subscriber, now is the time you want to go over there and hit that subscribe button. Because from here on out on this episode, it's paywall. So you got all of the previous content for free, but... From this point on, it's going to be behind the paywall for this episode, so hit that subscribe button. And if you are a subscriber already, stick around because we will be right back with some more content. To access the bonus content of this episode, you must be a paid subscriber. To do that, go to heynottheface.substack.com and subscribe today. Ow! Ow! Not the face! Ooh! Ooh! Okay, the face!